I, so, uh, thank you. So I, it strikes me as a little odd we bring a guy from Western Oregon to introduce someone from WSU to folks at WSU. So I'm not going to pretend to know her better than y'all. But uh, I just want to mention just a couple of her contributions to uh, egg producers. Uh, she's been a member of our scientific advisory committee uh, with UEP, one of the original members of that group. And uh, uh, that group was asked to come together to uh, make a list of recommendations for um, uh, United Egg Producers to set standards. At that time, you know, we, we all kind of operated as we saw fit. And uh, in light of things that were going on in the EU, we saw a need to put together a, a much more specific animal welfare program. And as a result of that program, which uh, Dr. Newberry was a big, a big part of, uh, we've seen a major reduction in uh, hen mortality rates. Uh, hens get a lot more space now. Um, we're an industry that's seen a lot of improvement, and uh, Dr. Newberry was a big part of that. So. Uh, we're very grateful, and uh, anyway, come on up. I love her talks. She's a, lots of fun. Okay, well, we're going to talk about a spooky subject today, whispering. And um, so I'm sure that you, you have heard of animal whisperers, and the I the terminology might give you the idea that it's something very secret and only a few people are capable and have the right kind of mental powers that they can communicate with other animals. Um, you can find people offering their services on the web who actually claim to communicate telepathically with animals. Um, there are also people who if somebody gives them information, they reflect that back to them, and, um, and the people feel good, and so it's really good therapy for people. Uh, but the kind of uh, whispers that I want to talk about today are those who use the body language and really strong knowledge and experience of being around a particular kinds of animals in order to interact with them and to understand their behavior. And um, so you've probably heard of Monty Roberts, the horse whisperer, or um, Cezanne, Cesar Milan claims to be the dog whisperer. And look at this! <laughs> there was a chicken whisperer! <laughs> I was amazed and I was a little disappointed to see the TM beside his beside his, um, na the chicken whisperer title because it means that I can't be the chicken whisperer. So I guess I'll have to be the hen whisperer or the pullet whisperer or something like that. Um, but of course the most famous um, real animal whisperer who uses understanding of animal behavior is the, the uh, famous Temple Grandin. You've all heard of her, I'm sure. And if you haven't, go watch the movie. It's really good. And, uh, and Dr. Grandin is a, is a serious scientist who studies animal behavior. And she spends a great deal of time watching animals and paying very close attention to their, where they hang out, uh, what they're interested in, uh, what, um, what they're afraid of. Um, and so, how does this relate to current issues in animal agriculture? Well, the production trends are that we're seeing fewer farms, and as farms get, um, or there are fewer farms, but more animals on the farm, um, and usually that means that there are more animals per caretaker. Um, and then with modern, um, public interest in animal welfare issues and some changes occurring in some parts of the, in, the um, animal sector. There's increased demand for providing animals with greater freedom of movement and behavioral expressions. And, and so this generally results in animals being taken from small groups or single pens and stalls into really large groups 
Um, and, and so then how is the, um, the animal caretaker supposed to really be a whisperer for these huge flocks of animals? Um, it gets increasingly hard to really um, have the time to spend with the animals and to really get to know each one individually. Um, fortunately, though, we do have um, increased automation going on, which helps us to mon or to manage these large herds and flocks. Um, just a couple of examples here. I mean, in dairy, of course, people have been using computerized milking for a long time to keep track of milk production. Um, the cows have ear tags, which um, will identify who they are so you don't have to remember all the patterns and uh, because there's a computer that will tell you who they are um, and you can make use of that if you if you um, want to go super high tech you can get into a robotic milking system and it will recognize each cow electronically um, and there's and this kind of technology is getting more and more sophisticated so in in, for example, the dairy industry, people have been using pedometers for a while now to detect um, high, higher or elevated activity levels in the cows, at, which is useful for detecting which animals are in heat. But those pedometers are getting um, better at reading behaviors other than just general activity. Um, and so we're using those now to develop algorithms which recognize more specifically what behaviors are, are going on um, so that you could detect, you know, when is the animal getting close to parturition, is the animal in discomfort, um, is the animal spending enough time lying in her stall, um, we, we want to see about 12 to 14 hours a day. Um, and so the, this kind of equipment can tell you if she's not getting enough rest, um, which might suggest that there's maybe a stall management issue or not enough um, stalls per animals. Um, or um, if, if she's maybe spending a lot of time lying down, maybe it might be an indicator of lameness issues. So there's, there's a lot of developments going on now in this area. Um, I, I get into this a bit with, um, with chickens, um, and um, so there's, there's an increasing market for cage-free eggs, and so hens in this case um, are kept in large flocks. These are actually organic chickens. Um, they have little doors they can go outside, but if you go inside, there's a lot of chickens there. Um, so how would you kind of keep track of all those animals? Well, we've, I've been working with colleagues at Michigan State University, um, and um, we've got these little accelerometer sensors that you can put on specific hens as kind of sentinels of the group. And what we're doing is we're, we're um, getting the accelerometer data from these sensors and, and using um, machine language training systems to identify the specific patterns of jiggling and juggling going on with the accelerometers to detect which behaviors are the animals performing. Um, and we can couple that with sensors that detect where they are in the facility. Um, and this is going to be really helpful as we go to these new systems and we can design them better to manage the birds better um, and, and um, make sure that they're all finding the food and water and the nest sites um, and the foraging areas. Um, this is a sort of joyful looking cow here. She's apparently, I just got this off the internet, she's She's been um, indoors in a barn for five months, and this is her first day out. And anyone who's had cows in over the winter knows what that looks like. Um, but but um, this kind of 
playful, exuberant behavior is very important for us to understand in our animal well-being circles. And um, there is research now going on at Agassiz, British Columbia, um, where they're, they're looking at pedometer readings specifically to determine how much play behavior is going on. Um, of course, all this needs validation when we're using equipment. A long time ago, I did a study with um, broiler chickens, and, um, and we had these little automatic weighing devices in the cage, as you can, or in, on the floor. Um, not exactly that design, but that sort of thing. And you get all these readings and you know, you, this is great. We know what the weight of the flock is and we can keep track of that. But of course, you can't rely totally on technology. You still gotta be out there looking at what's going on because when I spent hours and hours actually observing the animals, and you can see from one second from looking at this picture, um, when they sit on the, the little platform, they're the back end tends to hang off, and so you're not really getting a totally accurate weight there. Um, and so we can't really get away from the need to really pay a lot of close attention, even though we have these nice technology tools. And, and this is again Dr. Temple Grandin um, spends a lot of time watching the animals. And so this is the thing is, you too can become animal whisperers uh, by spending some time really getting to know your species. So, um, so let's see what's involved in becoming an animal whisperer because you've got to be really observant. Um, now, Temple Grandin is, and she, she notices the wiggling chains that are going to cause the animals to balk, and she's used all this observational knowledge to design cattle shoots that really work really well, that make it easy to move the animals, and she'll get right in there and um, right in there and see what it's like, what the cows are actually seeing. Um, I was interested to see that there is a veterinarian in England who's um, also a cow whisperer. See, anyone can be a cow whisperer. You, can, you can't be a chicken whisperer. Somebody's already the chicken whisperer. But you can be a cow whisperer. And, and, um, and so she, she goes around to farms and observes the animals and talks with the owners and finds out about how things are going. And so, you know, here she's got the owners and they're going to just check that the grooving on the floor is good, that the footing is good for the animals. Uh, one of the owners gets right into it, you know, <laughs> um, and he's going to go around like this and uh, check out the flooring. And then she's got them sitting in the stalls. And, uh, and this is a good thing, I think, because you can really, you know, spend a bit of time there. Is, is it it clean? Is it comfortable? Is the air good? Um, is the lighting good? Can you see well enough to read your newspapers? As Yock has already talked to you about the the underlying emotional systems of the brain of, of vertebrate animals including all the common animals that we keep on the farm um, and way back in 1872 Darwin wrote a very interesting book called The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. And he didn't really have any trouble attributing the body language to different sorts of emotional states. Now I'm going to draw upon Yock's great uh, studies of the circuitry of these different emotional systems. Um, <laughs> Because, um, I mean, obviously we need to avoid being uncritically anthropomorphic about what's going on when we see certain behaviors, but, you know, are we interpreting them correctly? And this is where having, you know, really getting to know your species and drawing upon the literature, mostly from rodents in the case of neurobiology, to really, um, use that information and then 
and then for, for the kinds of species that you're interested in, um, to look at the outward expression of the emotions through the behavior that the animals are showing. So let's have a look here. Um, now we talk about environmental enrichment for animals. And, and so you might think, well, what's, what's good enrichment, right? What could, we, what could we add to the pens of the animals that, that are just going to add a little bit more to the quality of life of these animals? And, um, and certainly we could look at those facial expressions and draw some, some um, prediction or some hypotheses about the fact that they're enjoying the, the, brush, the brushes and, um, and we can use the fact that they're approaching them and choosing, them to, choosing to use them. Um, but this is where the science comes in um, because you know, look at the price of this one on the right. It's $1,620 American. Of course, you can make a homemade one for a lot less. Um, but you might be interested, well, you know, maybe I'm interested in having brushes, but is it really going to make that much difference to the cows? And which design should I choose? And so, um, and so we can, as scientists, we can help you out a little bit with some of the details of working out what's um, useful um, and um, going to be the best bang for the buck, so to speak, in terms of enrichments for your animals. Um, this is one type of preference test or choice test that we did with chickens. Um, and, and basically what we had was we had um, areas laid out with black strings that we could uh, they were, we had eight areas in the middle of the pen here, um, and we had a really low stocking density so that the animals had lots of space to make decisions about where they wanted to be. Um, and then we had four of these quadrants were just basically open with nothing in them besides the regular food and water. And then we had four quadrants where we actually added these vertical plexiglass panels um, and we painted them with various amounts of green and we compared um, how much time or how many chickens are present at various intervals throughout the day um, and what we find is that modern jungle fowl which are the ancestor or the jungle fowl is the ancestor to the domestic chicken you know, maybe it's not too surprising that they preferred to be near the jungle area than now on the prairie, which is, this is the prairie and here's our jungle area. Um, and this was true of commercial strains as well as older, older, more traditional strains. And if you look at the sort of amount of cover that they're seeking to be near, and, and when they were near it, they were actually using it to preen themselves and to lie resting and do things that, that they would presumably be seeking safe, secure places to do those activities. Um, the kind of um, cover that was the most attractive to these animals was one which wasn't solid cover, but which allowed some cover, but enabled the animals to look through and see what's going on at the other side. Um, and, and so, is this useful information? Well, it is actually, because you can, you can um, use this idea to move chickens wherever you want. If you want to spread them out more into the center areas of the pen, um, instead of them all clustering around the edges, you put up some panels like this with some screen material. Um, and any kind of little scare or anything, like we throw these um, fake birds over the, swooping <laughs> over the top and so on. <laughs> where do they go? To the cover. Um, and, and, and that's where they, you will find them resting as well. But you may say, well, that's just looking at preferences, but it still doesn't tell me, you know, do I really need to give those cows the brushes or not? So another thing that we could look at is, 
how much work will the animals do in order to get access to those putative enrichments that we're thinking about? And I just briefly explain an experiment that's um, a, or a, a series of experiments done by one of my graduate students, um, Reagan Trudell Schwartz McGowan is her name. Um, and, um, and what she did was she, she did this with mice. They're easy animal models to get hold of. Uh, but you, we could adapt this for larger animals whenever there is an, an interest in, it and in a question. Um, and so she had these climbing tubes, and in the top she put various different kinds of enrichments, um, such as foraging materials, to see which ones, which ones would the, the mice work the hardest to get at. And to find that out, she laid the tubes first horizontal on the floor, and then each week she made it harder and harder for the mice to get up to those foraging options. And, and by doing that, she could really get a, a more economic measure of how, how important it was to the mouse in order to be able to get access to a particular enrichment. In this case, what she found actually was that, that the mice would, would work harder and climb steeper in order to get to a compartment that contained whole sunflower seeds with their holes intact, which they'd have to then break open to get at the nut inside, um, versus hold seeds that it, all the work had been done for them already. Um, there's the little mouse. Okay, so um, we also need to really watch out for injuries and diseases in the animals, of course. Now, and I'm just going to ask you quickly, who did this? See, this is where you have to really know your animals and be careful, because this is just the pig that happened to go by at the time I took the picture. It wasn't the cannibalistic tail-biting creature, but it sure looks guilty, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, just thinking about this kind of behavior, though, does it occur overnight? Can you, is it something where, like, Today it's there and tomorrow it, or today it's not there at all and tomorrow it's there with a vengeance. I mean, it may seem that way because suddenly you've got a big problem on your hands, especially in a big flock or herd where you, you, you haven't really watched really carefully what's going on. Um, and I'll give you an example with chickens here. What we did was we, we figured out that, that um, this behavior is learned behavior. And not only is it learned individually, but it's learned by watching others doing it. Um, and so in this example, we couldn't actually do this experiment with real chickens because the um, Animal Care and Use Committee would not like the idea of us putting in victims for cannibalism. Um, so so we, we had a sort of fake chicken here, and um, it's actually a, a petri dish of chicken blood covered with a parafilm coating, which if you peck at it hard enough, you can break that open and get at the blood inside. And, um, and so we exposed chickens in their cages to, to seeing this object, and then we would take pairs of them out, some often a private spot where the others can see, and um, and see, um, you know, h how many birds would figure out, and how long would it take them to figure out that they could get at the blood in there. Well, it turns out that they do learn that, but if you do something like this, where you actually have demonstrators that you've <laughs> trained to do this already. <laughs> um, so these are the demonstrators here, and they've already learned that they can get through the parafilm to get at the blood, i.e. the chicken. Um, and, and look at this. 
you know, they're all watching, aren't they? They're, they're paying close attention, you know. Maybe there's some food to be had here. And, um, and so what happens when you take pairs of chickens out of this, this cage and t put them off um, in somewhere private with, with a complete intact chicken model? They're going to be quicker to break through and figure it out. So, so this is something that, that um, this behavior is developing over time as they learn about these things. It just doesn't appear. They have to learn. And so as good chicken whisperers or hen whisperers, you can learn to look for those signs and catch that kind of thing developing before it becomes a big problem. Okay. Quick word, I'm, I've talked about some visual things that we can look at. Um, let's have a look at um, just briefly um, um, what's going on with odors here um, as you're doing your chicken or your animal whispering jobs on the farm. Um, now, if, if, you, if you notice that the ammonia level is high, it, chances are that you're going to see some some actual physical problems like lesions on the animal's feet and hocks. Um, but we can actually do experiments and find out from the animal's perspective, you know, how are they responding to the o ammonia or the dust levels in the barn? Um, and we can actually set up chambers and allow them to choose which ones they want to spend time in to and, and each chamber can be set with you know five parts per million, ten parts per million and so on and we can get a really good read on on the air quality that's desirable to the animal um, and if you do that you actually find that they detect the difference between five parts per million and zero parts and they're already at that point um, less likely to enter the chamber um, if, the, if there's even a little bit of ammonia. Okay, ears, sound, what can we learn about that? Well, David Fraser has already given us a lovely rendition of pig squealing. <laughs> so I'm going to get, I can't, I cannot repeat with such eloquence his his um, charming squeals, uh, but, but let's look at another vocalization that pigs make, and that's the bark, and it's like, whoa, like that. And, um, and so we can hear those sounds in different contexts, and we can wonder, you know, what does that mean to the animals? Um, in, in some cases, when it seems like they're really frightened, they will start going, whoa, whoa, and they'll be running away um, and freezing and turning around to look and see what happened. Um, but in other cases, they'll be bouncing around their pen, playing away. Woo, woo, woo. And, and so you might wonder, um, as, a, as an experienced whisper, you might think, hmm, I think that sound, that sound is just a little bit different than the sound when they're alarmed. And, and actually what we did with another student of mine, uh, Winnie Chan, um, she actually recorded vocalization, the barking vocalization. She, did, she ran them through computer analyses to look at the different aspects of or the acoustic qualities. And she did find that there are actually some small differences between the woofs made during alarm and the woofs made during play. And then she played back those sounds to other pigs to see if the two different kinds of woofs would cause them to behave differently. And, um, and she did actually find that the pigs that heard alarm woofs um, would be more likely to get up and move away than the ones that heard play woofs. Um, and so this kind of technique could be used in all sorts of amazing ways. I, I could imagine, you know, that we get an app. You know, you, you have your, your recorder and you go in the barn and you, you, you know, it'll tell you exactly. Once we, uh, the scientists have 
sort of figured out all the details, the app will be there for you to use. Um, and it could actually be useful in other ways. For example, in the pigs, um, we have um, an interest in providing enrichments for pigs to reduce things like tail biting, ear, bite, ear biting, and belly nosing, and to encourage some more natural behavior. And the best way to do that would be to provide some straw or compost or other materials, but that's kind of tricky on a barn with, with slatted floors, and so the standard way of enriching is to hang these objects in there, but unfortunately, um, they habit the animals habituate so super fast, and this is their response to hanging objects. Like, who cares? <laughs> um, so what we've been doing is we've we've put this um, sort of barking device into the pens, and and our idea is that maybe if the pigs will press the button and then sort of woo and and <laughs> start start running around, that 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 kind of um, acoustic accompaniment to hanging uh, or otherwise elevated enrichment objects could help to maintain their interest and enthusiasm for them. Okay, um, one, one last word um, about, so we talked about what we can see, what we can smell, what we can hear, um, but what about the, uh, the animals looking back at us, right? They're watching us too. And interestingly, a very interesting set of studies done by Keith Kendrick and colleagues um, with sheep um, is that they actually um, did single cell um, recordings from a part of the brain that's, in, that's responsible for recognition. Um, and they actually found that if sheep expect to see, to find a certain other sheep in a particular location, but they can't see them yet, that they would actually find that um, these recognition neurons will fire off, and that they actually also remember the faces of caretakers. So, so for long periods of time. So they're, they're looking back at you and they know who you are. Um, and and um, further on, they, they also found um, that the sheep were responding differently to different picture images of other sheep faces. And depending on what they were seeing, they were, would find differences in the level of calling, of stress hormones, heart rate, and activity in the amygdala of the brain, which is an area that's very important in the fear um, response. And, and so they found that the sheep are actually uh, more attracted and less stressed when they are shown pictures of calm sheep faces than stressed sheep faces. And moreover, this is a really neat part, is that pictures of smiling versus angry human faces affected their interest in approaching that person. So, so there's a lot to this whispering, right? Um, and, uh, and I hope that I've given you an idea that, that maybe you can all become, we could all become better whisperers. And, um, and, and once we are, we can get the t-shirt to prove <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I, okay, so thank you. <laughs>